Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 11th, 2013. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, we begin our tour of the Philadelphia area with a stop in Maple Shade, New Jersey. Chris LaPierre, brewer of the Iron Hill location there, shares some wonderful beers and some tips for home brewers on how we can brew similar tasty brews. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter. I'm Basic Brewing, all one word. Also on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. And our show page is at uh, facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. You can find our little community on Google Plus by searching for Basic Brewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. You know how it works. Uh, Whenever you think of shopping on Amazon, don't go to Amazon first. Go to our site first, basicbrewing.com. Click on the Amazon logo on the right side of the page, and it will take you to Amazon where you can shop as normal, and you won't even notice a difference in the process. The difference to us is that we will get a share of your purchase, and we greatly appreciate your support there. We also have associate links that work in a similar way for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. We have a Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes and our Android app on Amazon.com. We are, we're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, we're on the Stitcher app, and we're on the Windows phone directory, too. Check out our brewer's logbook at basicbrewingshop.com. In the front is a calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews. Good thing about the calendar is that it is blank. So even, the, it, even though it is approaching the middle of, Ju- of July here, you still have a full year of calendar pages uh, so that's good for you, and there is room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of beer. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com support, uh, basicbrewing.com slash support. Help us pay for the Philadelphia trip, <laughs> and thanks to everybody who has done so already. Uh, protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. The bag is essentially a cylindrical cooler that is just the right size to accommodate a 64-ounce growler or a couple of 22-ounce bombers, or three 12-ounce bottles. And it has an adjustable strap so that you can sling it over your shoulder. So you can check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Only limited number of those available. I harvested uh, hops from my yard this week. My uh, cascades were starting to dry up, starting to turn brown around the edges, and the uh, lupulin in the cones uh, between the quote-unquote, leaves of the cones looked nice and, and yellow. So I, I yanked the binds or the, the cones off the bind, uh, put them through a food dehydrator at uh, about 95 degrees, vacuum sealed them afterwards, uh, you know, divided them up into ounce sections or alf, uh, ounce of quantities, uh, bagged them up, uh, threw them in the freezer after uh, vacuum sealing them. And uh, at the end, I wound up with a little more than 13 ounces of hops, so I'm looking forward to playing with those, and uh, I'm going to write up an article on uh, all the details of the process uh, for publishing on BeerAndWineJournal.com later this week. So be sure to check that out. I t- took some pictures and everything. Uh, speaking of BeerAndWineJournal.com, Chris Colby and I are are so far keeping up with the goal of having new content every day on Beer and Wine Journal. And uh, Chris deserves most of the credit for that. He's been doing most of the heavy lifting and just amazing stuff that he's been writing. Uh, And we've been getting good traffic and good uh, comments back and forth. So I'm really, really happy about that. Uh, The basic brewing video episode on Club Night at the National Homebrewers Conference in Philadelphia is out there on the podcast feed and on YouTube. Uh, This year we talked to a bunch of good brewers And we got some tips on brewing some really interesting beers there on the floor of Club Night, including a no-boil Berliner Weiss, uh, a beer that had been fermented with wild yeast that had been repitched 10 times, and a blend of bacon beer and maple beer all in one glass. All were very, very tasty. And uh, uh, as a bonus, users of the Basic Brewing app We'll be able to see Steve drink from the uh, Barley Legal Homebrew Club Golden Urinal in the uh, bonus footage. 
Uh, we've got some time to look in the mailbag. Nate from Tacoma, Washington, writes after hearing last week's aeration experiment with the Barley Legal Homebrew Club. Nate says, for most of my beers, I use a plastic funnel with a medium mesh screen and just pour the wort through the screen, and that seems to agitate the wort pretty well. My question is, would that be enough to inject the proper amount of oxygen into the worts to uh, simulate shaking? I would be interested to know if anyone has done this sort of experiment, and if so, did they find it to be adequate for aeration? I answered Nate's question with the question, why not add a bit of fermenter shaking to your next brew in addition to the pouring through the mesh screen uh, to see if it does make an, uh, an improvement or a, different in your, a difference in your beer? Um, you know, I always say that if a technique or a process works for you, then, you, then you're doing it right. Uh, if you're making a good beer, you're doing it right. However... Uh, I'm always open to trying new things to see if my beers can get even better. And uh, Nate replied that he had, in fact, added some shaking to his latest brew day, and he will get back with me to let me know how it turns out. Chris from Wilmington, Delaware, writes, I enjoyed the show on aeration and wanted to comment that my favorite method has been to rack from my brew kettle into two separate plastic one-gallon jugs uh, from the spring water I use for brewing. I alternate filling the jug halfway, shaking it, then pouring it into my 6.5-gallon glass carboy while the other jug is filling up. I get a lot of foam this way, but with 6.5 gallons, there is enough headspace. It's cheap and effective and not as difficult as shaking a full carboy. Very interesting. Uh, I've not heard of that technique before. Now, rocking a, a full glass carboy is quite a workout and... and uh, Maybe if you've got some back problems or some physical limitations, maybe this is a way uh, to go to uh, try to to shake all of your wort a little bit at a time. Uh, I, I would want to make sure that the one-gallon jugs are sanitized, of course. On a different note, Tom from Seattle, Washington writes, I'm getting married soon, and my fiancé and I decided to brew a Bavarian Hefeweizen and hand out bottles of it to our guests as wedding favors. So me, my bride-to-be, and three of our homebrew buddies came over and had a wedding beer brewing party. Now, that sounds like fun. Uh, with each of us brewing a five-gallon batch of the same recipe. We only needed 15 gallons to have enough beers for the wedding favors, which left us with an extra five-gallon batch as a backup. The one that we ended up leaving on the cutting room floor turned out to be more bitter than the others. I wanted to do something unique with this batch rather than dumping it down the drain. I was thinking about adding raspberries but I don't know if the bitterness of the beer would clash with any fruit that we added. I was also thinking of turning it into a sour, but I don't know if the Bavarian Hefe would uh, be a good base for a sour. Any suggestions on what we could do with this experimental batch? Well, first of all, Tom, uh, congratulations and best wishes on the upcoming wedding. And if you know me, you probably know what I'm going to suggest. Break up the five-gallon batch into one-gallon fermenters, uh, secondary fermenters in this case, and play around with ingredients. You know, add raspberries to one, maybe the dregs of an Orval from another if you want to add some funk, uh, orange peel, spices, you know, whatever you want. Just let your imagination go crazy. And then you can take notes on what you think of the results and then, um, you know, scale up the successful ones next time. And, of course... Let us know how they turn out while you're at it. That sounds like a fun thing to do. Okay, let's get into this week's interview. Brian Colasar from TheBrewLounge.com took Steve Wilkes, Andy Sparks, and me on a very impressive tour of the Philadelphia area while we were there for the National Homebrewers Conference. The day started out in Maple Shade, New Jersey at the Iron Hill Brew Pub and a conversation with brewer Chris Lapierre. Well, here we are. We're in a uh, an empty bar and in, in an empty brewery before hours. Uh, and joining me are uh, Steve Wilkes. Hi, James. Andy Sparks. Howdy, James. Brian Colasar from uh, thebrewlounge.com. Here we go. Stop number one. Now, Brian, you are a tour guide today. Where are we and who are we talking to? We are... Well, how far are we? We're less than 10 miles from Center City, Philadelphia, across the bridge in New Jersey uh, in Maple Shade. Uh, it's the, uh, Chris, the ninth location, 
of Iron Hill uh, across the Philadelphia region. Uh, Chris has been here. He opened the, uh, uh, the location uh, almost four years ago, and him, he'll tell you more about it, I'm sure. Chris LaPierre, welcome to uh, Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, and thanks for uh, coming to visit us. Oh, we appreciate the hospitality, and you guys have, uh, or you've uh, opened the doors for us, and uh, you've got some beers here in front of us. Open uh, the taps, too. Open the taps, open the doors, open Before your heart, so. open your... <laughs> Maybe we'll get you to open your mind on uh, and talk about these beers uh, as well. But uh, first of all, give us a little background on where you have come from as a brewer. Well, uh, I've been with Iron Hill for a little bit over 10 years now. Um, I've worked at three of the stores. Uh, I know Brian from the working in the Westchester store, where I was for about six years. And I've uh, been here, like Brian said, since we opened and actually uh, did the construction here and everything. Uh, before that, I spent four years at Harpoon Brewery up in Boston. And I originally cut my teeth at Dock Street Brewery, the original one at 18th and Cherry. Um, I was there, there for about four years as a server and bartender and um, about eight months as the assistant brewer. So that's really where I got my, my brewing start. Is there home brewing back there somewhere? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where we all start. Um, I started at home brewing in um, the last semester at Syracuse University. I did a summer semester and all my friends had graduated. So uh, there's not a whole lot going on up there in the, in the summertime. So I needed a hobby. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I got my, my first uh, kid at uh, Heller Homebrew Supplies, which is no longer around. Um, and it started there, and then uh, I continued to, to homebrew when I was at Dock Street as a server and bartender. And yeah, so I probably was homebrewing for, I don't know, about two years before I started brewing professionally. So what's your setup here? How, what's your capacity? It's a 12-and-a-half barrel knockout. We do uh, just over 1,000 barrels a year. Um, this is our busiest location as far as beer goes in the, in the company. Uh, Ten locations overall. Yeah, uh, we're, we're building number ten right now as we speak. Yes, yeah, so we have nine open. But it looks like uh, from your tap list uh, and talking to you that uh, that you get to kind of express your creativity and sort of differentiate your location from others. Yep, absolutely. Um, we try to give our customers a mix of consistency and variety. So we definitely want you to see the personality of the brewer in, the, in every location. So we've got five house beers you can count on at any Iron Hill. You know, we have some customers that live in one Iron Hill town and work in another Iron Hill town and, you know, kind of appreciate that consistency. But then, yeah, we want people to have variety to give you a reason to visit a, a different Iron Hill. And uh, every brewer is a little bit different. You know, some are more into big IPAs, some are more into Belgians, some are you know more into German lagers. But we really do try to you know cover the cover the gamut. And uh, you've you've uh, been generous enough to, to supply us with some samples. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the beer that we started out with? Uh, that was the alt beer that we started with. It's called uh, Altman Aaron's for uh, one of our regular customers' seventieth birthday. He actually came in and helped uh, brew part of it. So, uh, but a traditional alt beer um, uses a Dusseldorf yeast, uh, cold fermentation, and a long cold storage. Um, plenty of hop bitterness, but no hop aroma, and really the nose is all about the malt. Um, fair amount of Munich malt, a little bit of Vienna, and just a touch of roast. And what are we talking gravity-wise? Uh, that was started off around 1042, I believe, so it's really right around 4% alcohol. Very sessionable. It's sessionable, but it's very satisfying. I, I loved it. I'm, my sample's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> I can get you more if you like. <laughs> it, uh, what I was really struck with was the, the bread-like character in the nose. So the malt, it's all about the malt, and mm -hmm. just absolutely lovely beer. Yeah, I like the firm bitterness. Uh, you know, I find that very refreshing sometimes, you know, when you get a beer that's right, real crisp and clean like that and has that nice firm bitterness to finish it up. It gives it a nice refreshing feel. So how do you, uh, what's the trick in maintaining that, that nice mouth feel with such a, a low-gravity beer, relatively speaking? Uh, plenty of body malts, you know, so there's a lot of Munich malt in there. Um, you know, that way you get the little bit of um, fermentables to, to give you that, you know, that 4% alcohol, but it's not going to carry a lot of body with it without the specialty malts. And uh, also a high mash temperature will, uh, you know, lock in a little bit more of the sugar. It's delicious. And, of course, the yeast. I'm sure the Dusseldorf yeast probably has something to do with that as well, although I can't, can't imagine the profile in my head right now. Now, and if you were, if you were a home brewer and maybe you're, maybe you're used to doing ales, is this a good um, sort of a gateway beer into the lager world? Yeah, probably, because it doesn't require quite as low a temperature as a, as a lager would. Um, but, it, you know, it is a little bit lower of a temperature. It's a, a cleaner beer. Um, also, I think a lot of people actually will use the Dusseldorf yeast, 
uh, for for loggers. So if they're if you're an ale brewery and you want to do an Oktoberfest or something like that, but you don't really have the temperature control, a lot of people will use that Dusseldorf yeast because it's uh, got such a clean profile. Yeah. What temperatures are we talking about? Uh, we fermented this. We do everything in Celsius, um, and I believe we fermented this at uh, 16 degrees, and we usually ferment at uh, 18 degrees for our ales, and we usually ferment our lagers at 12. So a little bit lower than a standard ale, but, but well above the, the lager temperature. Well, it's delicious. Um, it's, a, it's the first of, of several beers today. I'm <laughs> Brian, is, is, uh, you're uh, gracious enough to, to spend your day with us. Um, what do, you, what do you like about this location? What do you like about Chris's work? I like that, and once again, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that they've really opened the, you, you started off by talking about opening hearts and opening minds and whatnot. They really opened the minds of uh, local New Jersey beer drinkers that were looking for better beer that were coming into Philadelphia and the Philadelphia area looking for better beer because there was a lack of, how shall we say, better beer in New Jersey. Uh, so they, I think help break ground over in New Jersey for uh, beer drinkers and their palates and uh, one of the top volume locations if I'm not mistaken for Iron Hill. Yeah we're actually the third busiest location as far as overall sales but we're number one for beer so it kind of says something about the the shift you know the the product mix people really do come here to to drink beer and like Brian said part of the reason for that is uh, that there wasn't a whole lot going on when we came here Um, and I'm not going to pretend that we were the first kid on the block you know um, the, the Pizzeria Uno around the corner has uh, done a very good uh, beer program for a long time. And uh, there you have the Poor House and, and Westmont and the Blue Monkey. So there were places, but nothing like the Philadelphia suburbs, you know, or Brian's Neck of the Woods and, you know, Malvern and Westchester and Downingtown. Uh, so we really did help to kind of raise the level of beer. And it's, uh, I think it's helped overall. I, I've actually talked to people from uh, Yards and Flying Fish have told me that they've been selling more beer in this area since we opened up. Huh. I think some of our competition sees that our parking lot's always full, and they're like, hey, you know, maybe we have to pay attention to this beer stuff. <laughs> they're, all, they're all great. Okay, we, had, we had a little musical <laughs> interlude there, but Brian, you were going to say something. <laughs> no, I just want to make sure that I also said what I enjoy about not just this location, but all the Iron Hills, and to maybe tooth their horn a little bit more than Chris might do here is uh, they're making the great beers that we're enjoying but they're also getting recognized on a larger um, platform as well Great American uh, Beer Festival World Beer Cup Awards uh, uh, which size large brew pub of the year I believe it was yeah yeah uh, I think so it was they really racked the up the awards and and the recognition from the consumers as well as uh, the professional commercial so you, I was going to say you've got a, a lot of beers on tap. Uh, is there a strategy for that you're following for kind of converting people or, or introducing them to better beers? Is there a stair step kind of oh, method? Absolutely. Um, we actually, I think you notice up there, it says uh, seasonal Belgian ale. Uh, we used to have six house beers, and uh, you know there was no Belgian house beers. And then um, I always call the, the Belgian beer is the uh, it doesn't taste like beer beer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we all know that it, it does taste like beer because it is. It's water, malt, hops, and yeast, you know. But what, what people who don't drink beer mean is that um, it doesn't have bitterness. It doesn't taste like Bud Coors or Miller, you know. So I think it's really important to have one of those it doesn't taste like beer beers, something that's uh, fruity in character and it's got very little bitterness, you know. And if you think about what, what – scares people away from beer it's always going to be bitterness you know i love bitterness but um it's that one flavor that they've identified in beer that they taste in beer and they don't taste in any other adult beverage so they automatically associate beer with with bitterness um and also you have to think about when people are not drinking beer what are they drinking they're usually drinking something that's made out of fruit or that's flavored to taste like fruit you know whether it's uh you know, stoly orange or, uh, you know, screwdriver with orange juice or, or wine that's made out of grapes, you know. So I think it's important to always have something on tap that's not very bitter and that's, uh, that's very fruity. Maybe good advice for home brewers who are wanting to convert their own friends as well. Yeah, for sure. What should we go to next? Uh, let's see. We started with the alt beer and then I guess uh, Next one I poured was either the orange truffle or the American it's brown American ale. Brown. Brown. Okay, yep. So the American brown is, um, again, it was modeled after the, uh, the original Brooklyn brown ale, which uh, I, I believe is probably uh, modeled after the, the Pete's Wicked ale, which uh, I'm sure you guys remember that one. is you know, one of the first uh, craft beers out there. And uh, in my perception, the Brooklyn brown ale was a, kind of a bigger version of the Pete's Wicked ale. And I think over time, the Brooklyn has gone a little bit more English. 
And um, I just remember it being like a really big, hoppy American brown ale. That might have been just my own perception, but it's kind of what I was shooting for with this. So uh, plenty of malt character. You know, you got the chocolate malt, the, um, the pale chocolate we use, and a little bit of Munich for that bready character. And then uh, just, you know, lots of American hops in the nose and in the bitterness. Yeah, This is more chewy than the first one. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you caught me off guard. <laughs> you were thinking about the beer. I was. I was deeply entrenched with the beer. It's nice. I don't have a big comment about it. Mm. Really a nice beer. It's very. It's. Uh, uh, it is. It, it, it. There is a bitterness, but it's. But it's well balanced with a lot of uh, uh, the malt character, mm-hmm. and uh, there's a lot of roastiness in there. In fact, when I first tasted it, there's a there's a uh, Rauschbach on on the tap list and when I first tasted it there was so much roasty character that I thought it might have been smoky at first so uh, it's delicious very good yeah tasty beer um, nice hoppy aroma um, very drinkable mine's all gone as a matter of fact Mine is too. It seems to be a current thing I'm, I'm talking too much I'm behind and poor Brian he's driving so he's not drinking <laughs> so he's a responsible guy uh, but this is this is very nice and uh, it's you know, it's got. If it were a wine, you could say it's got legs because it's uh, sticking to the side of the glass. There, it's got. A, it's got great head retention. Um, some hints for home brewers on this style. Uh, I guess you know. It's. Re- I really like the the pale chocolate. Um, if you go into a homebrew shop, or even if you're a commercial brewery and you order chocolate malt, it's usually the darker cut type. And uh, something it's kind of the well not so secret ingredient in our, our pig iron porter, and something that a lot of our brewers rely pretty heavily on is uh, you know ordering that pale chocolate malt instead of the standard chocolate malt, and it gives you you know that chocolate character and a little bit of rose, but I I just think it's kind of like a softer rounder kind of character that you get from it. Right. Yeah, it's not as uh, sort of astringent or, or acidic. Uh, uh, Percentage wise, what are we talking? Uh, you know, I'd have to look at that. I, I want to say that it's probably. I would say it's probably around 7%, but um, wow. I'd, I'd really have to look at that. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. I can certainly uh, grab the brew sheet before, uh, before you guys head out. Uh, t- tell me about the water, your water. The, the water here is, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. I've gotten analyses done a couple times, and uh, it, it looks like on paper to be medium hard, but uh, I know that uh, I get a lot of scale. I get quite a bit of uh, mineral buildup in, uh, in my hot liquor tank, so I suspect that it's harder than the the analysis that I got um, and that could be due to the fact maybe we're getting water from different sources I know a lot of towns will you know oh, come yeah. out of an aquifer some days and out of a um, you know water tower other days depending on the on the rainfall but it's you know it's, it's pretty neutral it's um, surface water it's city tap water um, and I guess the really the nice thing about city tap water is that city pretty much takes out everything uh, except for hydrogen and oxygen and add back chlorine uh, and fluoride you know um, which we can flash off but um, what that does, is it, it allows you to start off with like a nice neutral water and then add back whatever minerals you want to it. Um, I believe there is a bunch of calcium sulfate in this to give it, you know, burtonize it just a little bit. Yeah. Or burtonize is probably a strong word, but make it a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, the only Iron Hill that we have that comes uh, out of a well is our North Wales location. And when we started brewing there, we actually had to cut back on our hopping rates uh, in order for the beers to fall in line with the other breweries. Huh. And uh, we've since uh, added a filter to, to you know help with that as well. But uh, yeah, pretty much a fairly neutral, like medium, medium hard water. Tell us about that big toy you've got behind you. The, I'm sorry. Oh, the, uh, the growler filler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, beautiful uh, Austrian-made growler filler. Uh, Victory was the first one in the country to have one, and for a while they were the only ones in the country to have one. Uh, my boss, one of the three owners, plays soccer out in Downingtown and goes and drinks at Victory afterwards, and he was looking at it, and uh, he called up Bill from uh, Victory and asked him if it was worth getting one, and Bill said, absolutely. He said, it's not even a question. Pretty big investment. It's about $25,000, depending, oh, yeah. on, depending on what the euro is, but it really pays for itself very quickly. Um, it's uh, we sell a lot more growlers here than we do in our other locations, and part of it's just the fact that it's it's easier to, to pour one. You know, if you've ever seen a bartender pour a growler out of a tap, it's a struggle. It takes time. There's a lot of waste, um, and you know that bartender could be 
selling three or four, uh, you know, other pints of beer you know, instead of pouring that growler. Yeah. So the fact that all they have to do is close the door and push a button makes it much easier to, to get the growlers out there. And it's better for our guests as well because it's, uh, it's better for the beer. Uh, it really works like a miniature bottling line. It purges the growler of uh, oxygen with CO2. Uh, then it pressurizes it with CO2 and fills it under pressure. So you don't get as much oxygen in there and, uh, and you, you don't lose as much of the carbonation to foam. Yeah, it's always frustrating to see half a growler of foam go down the drain yeah. when, when someone's uh, pouring one for you who doesn't necessarily know what they're doing. Uh, Even <laughs> if you kind know of what you're doing, it's kind of rough, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, and not only that, but all that foam you see going down the drain, in addition to the fact that you're losing beer, all that foam you see going down the drain is carbonation you're not going right. to have in your beer when you get it home. So. Right. What's beer number three? Where should we go next? Beer number three, I believe, was the orange truffle that I poured for you. And um, that started, I, I brewed a, just a, what I thought was going to be a traditional uh, Bach a few years ago in Westchester. It wound up being very, very chocolatey. Um, so chocolatey that, you know, you can never enter it in competition. I think people, no, that's the uh, IPA that you okay, have there. Okay. So, uh, but the, uh, it was really chocolatey, like I said, and, you know, couldn't, couldn't really call it a Bach anymore, but... What I saw was that if I ever wanted to brew a really chocolatey beer, that was my recipe. Uh, so we did that, added a whole bunch of orange peels. It's actually about five times as much uh, sweet curacao orange peel as we add to our uh, Belgian white. But despite the amount that we put in there, it's really still pretty subtle, just because there is such a, a firm malt base to it to, to balance it out. Um, yeah, it's kind of going for the can, uh, chocolate-covered orange peel. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Oh, my, good, good. My, my favorite candy in the world, there's a little candy shop in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and the guy, you know, like, uh, candies his own orange rinds, and then he dips them in chocolate. And at Christmas, I always go buy a pound or two, you know, to give away. And This is it. This is it in a glass. Great. So... So I'm wonderful. So I do, do I, I don't, do I have well, that beer? I'll pour you another one. Oh, because yeah, right oh, is that me? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I was right. drinking the I was drinking the light color when you started talking about box. I was like, what? what no, I, I'm How'd you, why, why I, you having, you having a having a what? <laughs> it's one of those. Am I? Am, do I embarrass myself by uh, asking the question or not? Talk about the beer. Anyway. Oh, it's delicious. It's, it has a wonderful chocolatey uh, you know flavor to it, and the orange is subtle, but per, but there you can pick it up. Um, doesn't slap you in the face. Um, kind of you know like you described it as like a little uh, chocolate uh, candy, orange candy. Mm. That's delicious. And I must, how do you how do you treat the orange peel? How do you brew with the orange peel? You just put it right in the boil at the whirlpool. Have to you, uh, put you it in a vegetable scraper. And uh, no, we we get dried, right. so okay. dried no, curacao no, orange peel. Okay. Yeah, from uh, just from a brewer supply group. Okay. So um, our Belgian white actually uses a blend of sweet and bitter orange peel. This is all sweet, mm. and again, a pretty you know much bigger volume. I think it was like fourteen pounds for a twelve mm. barrel batch. Yeah, the chocolate orange slices. That's the that's mm. the thing. <laughs> just like for, for visual reference, Steve is rolling his eyes and <laughs> going into a diabetic coma. <laughs> it's really good, but it's not. But it's well balanced. It's no, not it's sweet. Great. Well, that's there's a, there's bitterness and there's a good carbonation level to to balance out the sweetness. And again, I say that of all these beers, they're all very well balanced. Mm. They're everything's just right in line with these. Yeah, you were saying earlier that the that you thought that. Everything that you've tasted kind of comes from the same palate, or it same is, comes from the same place in your mind. Yeah, for sure. That's what I said. Maybe because they're all well made. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Mm. And we've got two more. And I don't know what. How are we doing our arts? We got, we got plenty uh, we, after that. Yeah, Brian, Brian's a taskmaster. Um, I He's should like, also tell you that <laughs> two beers on tap that are not on the menu. One of them is a. Uh, Britannomyces uh, quadruple. It's uh, called a uh, Brett Pete celebration. We actually have a program here. It's uh, the the secret sour program we call it, or the secret sour tower. So uh, <laughs> we we shoot to always have something wild on tap, but we don't tell anyone about it. And uh, part of the reason for that is like my biggest nightmare is somebody that doesn't understand Britannomyces or somebody that doesn't understand yeah. sour beers. Walking in here, getting a beer, and walking out and saying that we, we have a bad beer on It's tap. the worst beer I ever had in my life. <laughs> exactly. My God. So we kind of keep it close to you know yeah. close to home. Um, it's it's up to the discretion of our staff if they think the customer can handle it and understands it, then they'll sell it to them. Um, you know, people ask about it, so it's it's there, but you have to know about it and you have to ask for it. Uh, so the one we have on now is that Pete Celebration. It's called. It was made for a, a wedding of a guy named Pete. 
Um, it was actually my former assistant's uh, first recipe here, and he brewed it for his buddy's wedding. Uh, and then we did a bourbon uh, barrel aged version of it and a bread aged version of it. And then the other one that you don't see is uh, a Russian Imperial Stout. We had uh, um, all our home brewers were in here last night, so we had like a 35 person. A miniature beer dinner um, with uh, Jamil from the, the Brewing Network and the, the Yeast Book. And, um, so we wanted to have something special on just for those guys, and it's uh, still on tap from last night if you, if you want to try that one. And it, it, talk about your relationship with the home brewers. I mean, you talk about your iron uh, brewer program. Yeah, we have a great relationship with the uh, home brewers. I think it all started in Westchester with the uh, uh, guys from Buzz. Uh, I was pretty, pretty active with them. When I first came to Maple Shade, uh, there was really no homebrew club. There was one a while ago called uh, Gloucester County Homebrewers, I believe, and their homebrew shop closed down, and after that happened, they kind of fell apart. So there was really no homebrew club anywhere around here. Uh, and I kept meeting all these homebrewers, and, you know, lots of them, one after the next. And I'm like, how can there be this many homebrewers here and, and no homebrew club? So I decided to start one. So the uh, first homebrew meeting was, I think, uh, six or eight of us. Just kind of like hanging out and drinking some beers. Um, now it's at the point where the first Tuesday of every month, that back dining room is literally shoulder to shoulder with with home brewers. I think they're up to uh, 250 people in their uh, wow. on their email list now. So uh, they, they've gotten huge, and and I I got it started and then stepped back, and they've taken it way further than I ever would have. They set up booths at home at uh, not homebrew festivals at, at beer festivals. They actually have a booth just like a brewery they do um, food drives around thanksgiving they do all kinds of fundraisers so they've really gone just beyond uh hanging out and drinking beer and you know made themselves part of the community uh, we try to support them any way we can we give uh yeast home brewers if you bring in a sanitized snapple bottle i'll give you whatever yeast i happen to have in here uh we do the iron brewer competition every year which is people come in and collect our second runnings from a double ipa we make it's a 100% Pilsner malt, so it's a very neutral work to start with. They take it home and add that, add whatever specialty malts or adjuncts they want to add to it, uh, bring the beer back, and we do a, a competition out of it. And the winner of the competition gets to brew their beer on our system and name the beer and, and take home a keg. That's awesome. Uh, we also host a big brew day in our parking lot, which is giant. I mean, they take up the entire back parking lot there. So the National Home Brew Day, the first Saturday in May, uh, we open up the doors, you know, give them uh, give them water to, to chill their wort and everything, and um, you know, take care of their spent grain and everything, and just you know, really, we'll support homebrewers any way we can. They're very supportive of us, and it's a it's a great mutual relationship. That's awesome. And uh, the the Iron Brewer winner is on tap right now. Speaking of that, it's the uh, Buccaneers Bounty that you see there. It's a, a rich American brown ale with uh, toasted coconut and dark Sumatran coffee. Oh. <laughs> oh man, you're killing me! You ready to move to that one? You're killing me. <laughs> well, uh, it is coffee time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what? Okay, so we, so Brian's looking at his watch. So <laughs> he's got a full schedule for us today. I can send you home with growlers. So you can <laughs> taste at your leisure too. We don't we don't have refrigerators in our hotel rooms. We'll just have, to, have we'll just have to drink them right there. <laughs> Uh, so what, what do we got here? That is a Petite Fortunella, which is a collaboration that we did with Allagash. Uh, it was a recipe that was written by one of their brewers, uh, not their head brewer, but um, the guy who's in charge of their pilot program. Uh, my girlfriend is a rep. She's a Philadelphia and uh, D.C. rep for Allagash. So uh, Patrick Chavanel, the brewer at Allagash, sent us the recipe, and we worked back and forth on it over email. And then Suzanne and I brewed it here, and, uh, and this is what you have. It's a uh, Belgian session beer. It's based on a um, the Petite uh, Fortunella is, is based on the uh, the name comes from uh, the fact that it's a tribute to Petite Orval, which is the the mm -hmm. monk's beer, the table beer. So very sessionable, about a four four and a half percent alcohol. Um, all Pilsner malt, um, a fair amount of American hops, Cascade, and a little bit of uh, East Kent Goldings. It's fermented with a Bastogne strain of yeast, which is basically the Orval yeast without the Britannomyces. And then it's finished with uh, fresh uh, a kumquat puree, which is, uh, that's where the Fortunella that's comes from. It's the Latin that. word for, it's, it's kind of neat too, because you get the fruit, but you don't know where it's coming from because the, yeah. you know, the American hops are, are really uh, fruity. Um, the Orval yeast has got, I think, like a kind of a peachy or apricot character. Mm -hmm. And then you have the actual fruit, the kumquat. So you're kind of getting different fruit characters from several different an uh, angles. There's a lot going on in there for such a little beer. Well, there really is. I mean, the kumquat thing is just killing me. The, the nose, the bouquet of this beer is amazing, I think. 
Andy, your thoughts? No, I really like this one too. It's nice light color, um, nice and crisp. Um, has kind of a very unique kind of aroma to it. Um, yeah, delicious. And how did you handle the fruit? The fruit we um, did in two stages. We pureed it just in blenders. Um, the neat thing about kumquats is you're meant to pop it in your mouth and eat the whole thing. It's kind of like eating a grape. Um, thicker skin than a grape, but the, the skin is actually a, a part of the experience. It's really kind of tart. Uh, so that's where you get that kind of refreshing tartness. So we did a puree and added it to the to the boil, to the whirlpool in, in big mesh bags. And then um, added another puree to the, uh, to the uh, fermenter. So it once again made a puree, added just enough hot water to pasteurize it. And pump the whole thing into the tank, and then uh, and then filtered it out. At, um, you know when it went to the bright tank. Boy, that's wow. a way to make a fruit beer. Yeah, that's inspiring because it's not. You know when you think of fruit beers, uh, I mean you, we were talking about fruit beers what yesterday or yeah. you, you know talk, you think about the the idea of having fruit in a beer is often better than the the final product because mm-hmm. it's sometimes it's overly sweet or sometimes the fruit just you know slaps you in the face. This is well balanced, and and the fruit is a, is a, just a component of the overall thing. Yeah. So if you, if you didn't know it had kumquats in it, you wouldn't be able to pick them out and say, "I think this has kumquats," but it has a nice fruity character that you're that you're that you taste. What this beer reminds me of is not really even a Belgian beer. It's um, I don't know if you've had any of the stuff that the Italians are doing these days, but the Italians are doing some really nice stuff with uh, Belgian inspired beers, and uh, all this stuff they do is very sessionable and balanced and. Uh, Someone, uh, I went to a class on, on the Italian microbrews, and the guy brought up a good point. He's like, Italians like to eat, and when they drink, they're they're drinking with food, you know. So it's uh, all the beers that these guys are making are really meant to go with food rather than trample over food. And as a result, yeah. they're pretty delicate and balanced. And uh, I actually feel like this is more akin to a Italian microbrew than, a, than, than some of the Belgian beers. <laughs> One last beer, because Brian is pacing now. So <laughs> <laughs> He's a taskmaster. You guys have to try the Buccaneers Bounty. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, well, I, so, I, I what, have what, to get a taste of the Roush beer. What, oh, okay. Oh. Just a little taste. <laughs> so we got two more beers but in addition little, to the one that we had. Time. I, just want to, I just want a taste of the Roush beer. <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, well, and I've checked the traffic reports, and I think we're uh, we're all clear <laughs> on going across the bridge back into oh. Pennsylvania. So. Now, to give an idea, of, for the to road. give an idea of how good a uh, Brian, uh, good a host Brian is, he he not only sent, he sent a spreadsheet with a map embedded with little yeah, numbers and and uh, where we're going, and we now we got the Roush beer in front of us, oh. and hey. rolling eyes are rolling See, again on Steve's side of thing. And, uh, yeah, there's moaning over on Andy's yeah, side. And, uh, yes, yes. Can't tell if it's a fireworks yes. show. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Just so, a, I yeah. can just smell it. Uh, can we just have this in the car so I can just smell it? Yeah, this is one of the things I really love about uh, about a Roush beer is that, you know, it's like you can smell a campfire on the wind, mm. and you keep ta- taking another sniff to try to get that good smell again. You know? mm. Oh my God! Oh my God! That's bacon in a bottle right there. (laughs) Oh my gosh! What percentage of uh, smoked malt? That's right around fifty percent. Oh wow! (laughs) This is the uh, Vireman smoked malt, which is um, it's actually pretty delicate. I mean, you can you can use you can make a hundred percent smoked beer and have it still be drinkable because it's uh, fairly subtle. The the American the British smoked malt is much much more aggressive, and you never want to use fifty percent. That's wow. the cherry wood smoke. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And that's it has in- much more strong flavor. That is intense. That's that's, that's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I'm just it, it's funny you use the word intense. I, I find it much more balanced than some of the smoke beers I've had, whereas mm-hmm. the intensity of some smoke beers is smacks you in the face. Yeah. Um, whereas this is you're right. <laughs> whereas this is much nicer. You keep wanting to take another sip mm-hmm. and yeah. experience that smoky Smokiness again. Yeah, I don't feel like I've licked an ashtray. Yeah, is there a rib joint anywhere nearby? <laughs> 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 they may have rib here, ribs here. I don't know. Uh, and then, and then the, uh, then this is the homebrew. Yeah. No, who brewed it? Buccaneers Bounty. This was, um, it was. Let's see, Martin, Mark, and uh, oh man, I've forgotten the third guy's name. I'll, I'll get you their actual, you know, first and last names. But um, they're all members of uh, Barley Legal, which is a homebrew club that we helped to start and. Uh, you know, sponsor and, and really support anytime we can. But a really good group of guys. Uh, Holy schmoly. <laughs> wow, they're cool. Yeah, they did a nice insane. job with it. Yeah. Wow. They were they were a little bit concerned at first that it was um compared to their original batch, this is a little bit higher on the coffee and a little bit lower on the coconut, but I, I still think it's a it's a nice balance. You know, don't want it to taste like a mounds bar. 
Well, I... I don't know why not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. not a bad thing. Wow. This is wonderful. Okay, how'd you get the coconut flavor in there? The, with uh, coconut. So we use uh, shredded coconut. Um, oh. It was, you know, already came shredded, but it was no sugar or anything like that. It yeah. wasn't like the baker's stuff. Yeah. So just 100% pure shredded coconut, and uh, they've roasted it in our oven. So yeah. one of our chefs... One of our chefs is a home brewer, so uh, he's always the guy that I go to when I need to use a kitchen. You know, for our pumpkin beer, he comes in and helps me roast the pumpkins. And So he showed up at 6 in the morning to roast the coconut so he could be out of the way of the kitchen by lunchtime. And, uh, man, when I walked in here, just the entire – we have an open kitchen. So there's no doors or anything. So the entire restaurant just smelled like uh, coconut. Mm. So, um, And, again, with this, we added in two stages, once in the Whirlpool and once in the fermenter. I've, I've been to uh, lucky enough to been to uh, Maui Brewing Company. I've seen a big, uh, yeah. a big, uh, big plastic trash bin of uh, uh, roasted coconut. Ah, man, well, I don't. You know, you know, if you weren't here, Brian, we'd just be here the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, this would be pretty much. This would be pretty much it. <laughs> Can I, I show a growler pre- for you guys? Okay. Take them. A growler. Take, take with you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You um, spoiled this. Uh, yeah, we have nice what would be nice would be to be able to get that a little video of that. Oh, the, oh there, yeah. yeah. Oh, there, there's our excuse. There you go. There so you we'll go. we'll close this part off. Chris, thank you so much My for pleasure. your hospitality. Thank you so much. Uh, many compliments you on everything. My pleasure. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful beer. Wonderful stuff. And thank, thanks, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian. So we're one for one so far. Yo, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my Excellent. stars! Just slap me in the face and knock me down. <laughs> Thanks again to Chris LaPierre for the generous hospitality. And thanks to Brian Colasar for prying us away from Chris's bar (laughs) and taking us to the four other wonderful stops on our Philadelphia tour. And, uh, man, thanks, as always, to Steve Wilkes uh, and to Andy Sparks, owner of TheHomeBrewery.com, for the use of their palates and their... Uh, Their tasting skills, what a lot of fun. Just an amazing, amazing day. And the brewers of the Buccaneers Bounty from Barley Legal Homebrew Club are Mark Ferfaro, Sean Catterabeck, and Martin Webb. That was an amazing beer. Congratulations, guys. And I, I know I met at least a couple of those guys. More from Philly next week. Uh, In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our new Basic Brewing Growler bags are available in our shop. Protect your precious homebrew and your craft beer as you take it from place to place as the weather warms up this season. It's already warm. It's hot. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to the podcasts. We'd like to expand our coverage, like going to Philadelphia for for one way, for one thing. Uh, That helps. Uh, Any support that you can give us helps. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one dvd at a time and you can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store too our log books are in the store as well keep track of up to 50 batches of beer you can see a list of the fine folks across the country who sell our dvds on basicbrewing.com and if there isn't a vendor in your area you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link we greatly appreciate the support our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are bath and body works forever sunshine fine fragrance mist eight ounce new look and rhode island novelty light up led transparent bubble gun thanks again and remember i can't tell who bought what so no worries there just click on the Amazon.com logo in our store the next time you feel like our site, our website. The next time you feel like Amazon shopping, we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association or, and or subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.